Yeah, so let's talk about the basics on XBB 1.5. This is uh, an, uh, an evolution of the Omicron variant, which has been dominant since um, you know late uh, uh, 20. 21. Um, and uh, so what we're seeing is that, for example, in the U.S., about 40 percent of new infections appear to be being caused by this XBB variant. Uh, and, and in other countries, we're seeing similar, quite rapid rises. Um, and we've seen this in the past when a variant gets an advantage, an evolutionary advantage over others, and they're able to spread more easily. So we're starting to see that same pattern we've seen in the past, that this may become a dominant variant. Here in the U.K., it's about 4 percent which is relatively low, but also on the rise. What we know so far is that it seems to be behaving similar to Omicron, meaning that um, uh, it, it is very transmissible and that it's found some ways to escape um, existing immunity that we may have built up from previous infection or from vaccination. And that's what's giving it an, an advantage. Um, other things around um, you know, testing, the severity doesn't appear to be um, higher than other variants, but I think time will tell. Um, it remains, I think, in everyone's best interest, particularly those who are high risk, who are over 50, who have medical conditions, who have access to the bivalent booster, the most recent booster, to get that because vaccines are still our best protection. Peter, I can't help thinking that so many people have become so complacent about the risks. I mean, in my own social circle and people I know, it's about 50-50. Some of us, I had my fourth vaccine. I, I took it as soon as I could as well. But some very smart people I know are saying they're not bothering and partly because they say they know medical health professionals who are also not bothering as well. Do we need a new campaign of awareness from within the health service and indeed in the broader population? It's a terrific question. I think one of our big failures over the last year was that we went from this kind of overwhelming, very intensive response to um, to COVID-19, right? Uh, lockdowns and everything else to, you know, sort of getting rid of everything. No more restrictions, no more masks, and sort of all on or all off, as opposed to really transitioning into a new approach that's kind of fit for purpose now in 2023, the fourth year of this pandemic. The reality is that COVID is not going away. Um, the reality is that COVID is still causing a lot of deaths, but that's confined largely to populations already at higher risk. Um, those who are over 65 um, and, uh, and with medical comorbidities, etc. So what we need to do is come up with a new um, way of thinking about COVID management and our risk profiles. That's still going to be individualized. I still find it useful to think about kind of a, a risk budget, um, what things I'm willing to take on and, and, and not take on. I do choose to mask uh, occasionally in very high risk settings, usually at a time when I just don't want to get sick, uh, because in addition to COVID-19, we have RSV and we have influenza and we have lots of things going around. Um, so I think there are some pragmatic and practical things that we can do to reduce our risk, still to reduce risk of loved ones. Every holiday now, um, for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to have questions about visiting elderly relatives and protecting them from COVID. So this isn't going away, and I do think we need to recalibrate our approach. Um, uh, it's not necessarily the emergency that it was a couple of years ago, but that doesn't mean we should stop caring.